session this afternoon is David Harvey commenting on the falling rates of profit in Marx's crisis theory. And David will have up to 45 minutes. But the less, of course, then the more time for discussion. Yeah, I, I want to leave as much time for discussion as possible. And, um, sorry if uh, visitors think I'm going to give a, a coherent talk to uh, uh, for all of you, but um, we're, we're talking about some issues here and have been for some days, and it's in that spirit that I'll uh, venture a few uh, comments. Um, and I, I want to thank uh, you for inviting me to this uh, this meeting. It's actually not very often I get uh, the opportunity to sit down with economists. I'm, I'm uh, fearful of them usually, but they seem to be not bad guys. <laughs> <laughs> actually, so and it's. Uh, but um, I thought that um, I, there was something that's come up during the conference that I thought that I would uh, raise in Star Wars, which is not in the written paper. And it's, uh, I, I'm, I'm a bit leery of causal language. And when you postulate the question, what's the cause of the crisis, it seems to me sometimes that leads into somewhat wrong answers. And I'm leery of the causal language because my conception of capital is that it is both a, a process and a thing. Uh, it's rather like uh, the famous controversy over what is light. Is it a particle or a wave? And the answer of quantum physics gives eventually is that it's both. And there's this question, is capital a process or is it a thing? And my answer is it's both. Uh, but it's a process that appears as a certain thing. It appears as money at one point, as productive activity at another, commodity at another. I think it's important uh, to look at those metamorphoses of form that capital takes, uh, and also to ask questions about what are the capacities that capital has in those different forms. Uh, for instance, the money form, as I mentioned earlier, is the butterfly form. It can flit around all over the place. Uh, the commodity form can sort of uh, move around. Uh, uh, production is uh, harder to move, not impossible, but uh, so there are many differences. Uh, and there is something very important which relates to the paper we've just had, which is the money form is the only form of capital that can be accumulated without limit, without any limit whatsoever. And I think this is important because uh, uh, there's a tension, it seems to me, between uh, how to keep a compound rate of growth going uh, in a situation where there seem to be some limiting factors around on both uh, commodity production inputs and all the rest of it, uh, and uh, some limitations uh, on productive, uh, or the organization of productive uh, capacity. Uh, and the tendency to move to the money form has a lot to do, I think, with its limitless capacity. Uh, and, and so we might want to throw that uh, into the hopper. Now the process for me is, uh, uh, of course, uh, paramount. And uh, you know, people have used analogies uh, about uh, you know, sick bodies and medical and so on. My analogy is essentially with fluid dynamics. Uh, capital began as a trickle, it turned into a, a stream, it turned into a river, it turned into a mass. And now we've, we've got uh, capital sloshing all over the world. Uh, and uh, within that stream, which is constantly increasing, which is of course one of the features which is central to capital's nature, uh, there are eddies here and uh, collapses there and barriers somewhere else. So if we were sitting and having this meeting in Detroit, we would be very aware of a place that's in terrible crisis. I look at the window out here, and it doesn't seem to me that Izmir is in a terrible crisis. Uh, there are, of course, always problems around, but that's not the issue. The question is, how is capital accumulation doing? Um, I, in my visits to this region, I have often had the, the interesting experience of uh, shuttling forth between Istanbul and Athens. And of course, uh, the contrast is, uh, is dramatic uh, in terms of uh, what you see. So capital is like that. 
so there are crises in particular places at particular times, and, and they're fiercely, fierce crises for the people who, who live through them. Uh, earlier we were talking about the crisis of industrial deindustrialization uh, that uh, cities like Baltimore and Pittsburgh and so on and Sheffield and, and Mumbai uh, went, uh, went through. Uh, but then the question is when do we start to actually take all those, when do all those many crises as it were come together to create uh, some uh, mass kind of global crisis where everybody feels some sort of stress at the same time although with different intensities in different places. And how does it then, that crisis, move geographically? A uh, crisis that began in Southern California and the uh, and, and American South in, in, in general, uh, then switched into the financial system, and anybody who had been stupid enough to buy any of those collateralized debt obligations suddenly found themselves in crisis, be it a German bank or a French bank or a Norwegian municipality. But if you didn't buy those things, you didn't feel it. What you did feel is when the US uh, consumer started to deleverage from housing markets, A, they couldn't remortgage their, their finance and use that to go buy things, and B, they couldn't spend their money on other things. So suddenly the collapse of the uh, American consumer market had a tremendous impact on those countries that are exported to the United States. China lost about 30 million jobs by the beginning of uh, 2009. But the interesting thing about China was by the end of that year, they'd only lost, had a net job loss of around 3 million, which means that somehow or other they created 27 million jobs in about nine months, which was, of course, this vast program of infrastructural investment and, and, and the like. So the, the, the crisis moves around, and you never know where it's going to be. Uh, there's a sovereign debt crisis in Greece. Suddenly, Dubai world goes belly up, and it's in the Middle East, and you don't know where it's going to occur next. Uh, the BRICs were doing very well, but Brazil is in a lot of difficulty right now. I mean, things move around, and so um, they move around sectorally from one sector to another, as well as moving around geographically. And so I would want to talk about that flow across space and time. And, and the causality in that is kind of a little hard to establish uh, because uh, actually the situation today is very much a definite, you know, is by definition defined by what it was yesterday. Uh, and actually this is a good principle of, of, of forecasting the weather in many parts of the world. If you say the weather tomorrow is going to be exactly the same as it is today, you know, plus or minus of one degree or something like that, you're going to be right, something like 65 or 70 percent of the time. And if you're in the tropics, you'd be right 100% of the time. So this is a kind of a, a, a flow version. Now, uh, I, what I did in the paper, of course, was to kind of get a little, little uh, annoyed at those people who kind of say uh, the crisis of 2007, 2008 was a result of the quote, falling rate of profit, and it's just, and, uh, it doesn't seem to be, it was terribly helpful. It doesn't seem to me it's particularly true, so I decided to go back and, and do, do a little number on the, uh, what I thought about uh, the fallen rate of profit, theoretically, and what I think about some of the proofs that supposedly exist of uh, its existence. Theoretically, I'm not going to go through how it's defined, theoretically, everybody here knows it. It has countervailing, in, in, uh, uh, countervailing influences, and it also, uh, there's a third chapter in Volume 3, where he talks about uh, uh, where, the heading of which is the internal contradictions of the general law. Uh, it turns out, uh, since I've been exposed last week to finding out what Marx's notebooks look like, uh, that from which Engels compared, you know, prepared this material, uh, and the original notebook, which is one manuscript, it's not three chapters, uh, Engels supplied the chapter headings. And, 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 clar and quote, clarified, in some cases exaggerated, uh, certain aspects of uh, the argument, most spectacularly in a point where Marx talks about if factors that could make the interest rate, uh, could make the profit rate rise. Uh, Engels ended it by adding his own sentence, which said, but in the end, we know that it falls as we've already shown. Um, so that Engels was a bit more you know, kind of excited about the falling rate of profit than Marx was. What came down to us as a third chapter, uh, when I was writing 
the stuff about this and Lewis to Capital back in the 1970s. I, I kind of found that the, the, the law, uh, which then became a ten, uh, law of attendancy, and then became a tendency. Uh, I, I, I found uh, by the time you went through all the countervailing influences, which were six listed in, in capital, but if you go to the Bloomberg Reserve, uh, there's uh, four or five more, most important of which is uh, the opening up of new sectors which are labor intensive. Um, you know, it seemed to me it was a kind of a pretty much of a wash. You didn't know whether the profit rate was going to go up or whether it was going to go down. It didn't seem to me that there was this, any kind of firm thing, you know. Uh, but most of the language, it turns out, suggests it was a firm thing in spite of it, all the countervailing influences. Uh, most of that language uh, uh, turns out to have been inserted by Engels. It wasn't there in, Engel, in, in Marx's original. Uh, thing. The other thing is that Marx himself didn't seem to use it very much. You can't find it in his political writings almost anywhere. The two crises he looked at in Volume 3 of Capital, 1847 and 1857, were analyzed as financial and commercial crises, and there was only one passing reference to the falling rate of profit. Uh, and it also turns out, and I learned this from uh, Fred Mosley last week, is that Marx never came back to the question of the falling rate of profit after 1868. So he had at least a dozen years in which uh, he was actively working on the manuscript where he never touched it, the whole thing. And he just left it as it is, even though it was obvious that he needed a good deal more work to really substantiate uh, what he was talking about. So there's a, a sort of growing consensus among most people, not Fred Mosley, but uh, many people, that actually uh, the emphasis upon the falling rate of profit doesn't really uh, concur very well with what Marx himself uh, held. And I felt that when writing Limits to Capital way back, and, uh, but I found the most interesting part was what we now call now chapter 15 of volume 3, where, which, which Engels calls the, the uh, contradictions of the, uh, of the law. Now, actually this is a, mis a, a wrong title. Uh, to say it's contradictions means the law exists but it's contradictory. Uh, what it should be. Uh, title is something like what happens when you abandon the assumptions under which the law was derived, because it turns out that the law of uh, falling rate of profit was was actually derived under exactly the same assumptions as defined the general law of capital accumulation in Volume One, and Marx is very explicit in Volume One as to what those assumptions are. First, there is no realization problem, all commodities sell at their value. Uh, which means there's no problem in effective demand in the market. Secondly, the way in which the surplus value is divided up between rent and interest and pro profit of enterprise and all the rest of it doesn't matter at all. And thirdly, you're dealing with a closed system. Uh, that is, capital is everywhere established and that therefore there's no trade with non-capitalist organizations and, and the like. And those assumptions are very clearly written out in volume one, but they turn out to be exactly the same assumptions. Uh, under which the law of falling uh, rate of profit is derived, and then the question arises, well, you build a model like you did in Volume 1 of Capital of the production of the Industrial Reserve Army, and it's very useful and helpful to understand certain aspects of the dynamics, but you can't take it too far. Uh, in fact, if you don't start to put in the fact that actually working class demand has a very important role to play in all of this, then you come to a very wrong conclusion. Uh, as to what the dynamics of capitalism might look like in general, as opposed to what they look like under the assumptions that Marx used in Volume 1. And I take the same, the same argument about the Volume 3, falling rate of profit argument, that uh, the, the whole kind of question of the rate of interest and all those sorts of things is excluded from Marx's analysis. Though in Anwar's description of profit rate, I notice the interest rate gets deducted, which it seems to me is, you know, is, is, is going beyond Marx's assumptions. Uh, in, in, in interesting in interesting ways. So, but in, in volume three, in, in chapter 15, Marx does all kinds of other things and starts to say, you know, look, uh, one of the first things that happens when the profit rate falls is you go in for a bout of uh, another bout of what he calls primitive accumulation, or I like to call it over, uh, or I, I like to call the accumulation by dispossession. And in fact, he raises the question of the, 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 the aspect of accumulation by dispossession, uh, what he calls decapitalization that occurs through the centralization of capital and the eradication and elimination of many small capitals, that this decapitalization plays a very important role uh, in restoring the conditions of uh, profitability so that 
Uh, then this arises in the final part of the paper by me talking about accumulation by dispossession in housing markets, uh, how much assets were actually stolen uh, by thievery and robbery, and, and all the rest of it. So I want to re reintroduce that uh, into, into you know, what capital is about. And, and because if you don't reintroduce that, I think you miss out on some of uh, the important things that have been happening. Uh, through what the financial system is about. And I would remind you in Marx's chapters on primitive accumulation, one of the primary means by which uh, accumulation by dispossession occurs, and primitive accumulation occurs, is through by the credit system. Uh, so if you look at the role of the credit system and the transfer of property rights in the 1930s in the American agrarian sector, and you then look at the transfer of property rights in the housing market very recently, you see a massive transformation of asset values uh, uh, going, going on through this process. And this is kind of clearly articulated, and of course, uh, in, as one of the ways in which the profit rate uh, can be restored, which is uh, uh, going back uh, to, uh, I think, uh, what Anwar mentioned the other day, uh, sort of a version of profit on alienation, but I prefer uh, to, to use accumulation for dispossession because uh, we're not talking about alienation here, you're also talking about robbery, thievery, thuggery that was going on in the, in, in the housing markets of the United States in which uh, some 7 million households lost their, which is about 30 million people lost their homes uh, to, a, to a predatory system and a lot of it was illegal and it turns out to be to have been uh, illegal. So, so that, that enters into chapter 15. The other thing that enters in is, well, what happens when we actually drop the idea that uh, we have uh, a closed economy? So it starts talking about, well, you know, what happens when capital starts to flow abroad? What happens when it goes, finds other places to do things and engages in what are those are called a spatial fix? Uh, what does it do? So, so that then gets uh, introduced, and then, and then of course, uh, aspects of the credit system, but perhaps most important uh, of all, is uh, the way in which Marx uh, actually treats the question of working class consumption and restriction on an effective demand by the fact that you're, you know, you've got a class divided society in which uh, money is circulating to the upper classes in ways which are unlikely to actually circulate back into, into consumption in any kind of uh, uh, real way back into the real, real economy uh, and uh, the large, largest segment of the society is uh, suffering from wage, wage repression and the greater the wage repression Marx argues in both volume 2 and volume 3 of capital uh, can be a major cause of crisis and of course in volume 1 of capital it was the other way around that actually advantageous conditions for labour uh, to, to actually press its uh, demands and can actually lead to a fall in the profit rate simply by, so, so either way you've got a fall in the rate of profit, either by wages diminishing or by wages rising, you might be likely to get some impacts on the profit rate that can go one way or the other. So this was, if you like, uh, some, some of the theoretical reasons why it seemed to me that, uh, again, the whole kind of question of fall in the rate of profit becomes a sort of, a sort of wash, it could go one way, it could go up, it could go down, go this way. And, and uh, there are several people now working for the uh, mega manuscripts, most of all Michael Heinrich, though he takes it a little too far, I think, uh, who starts to say that uh, the foreign rate of profit uh, has no basis for understanding crisis theory in Marx. And I think that actually I drew a lot of my ideas about how to understand crisis theory from the chapter 15, which changes the language from foreign rate of profit to overaccumulation and a plethora of capital and surpluses of capital labor side by side as being the de defining moment in, in, in the way in which uh, crisis tendencies of capitalism, which are omnipresent, come, come, come together. Now I then went into sort of, okay, but uh, you know, everybody who talks about foreign rate of profit usually has a graph, and I'd be very interested when the book comes out, John, to see how many different graphs there are of what's happening to the profit rate in the different chapters, and see how they all actually <laughs> relate to each other, or what they look like, uh, because they we all... You could have an overlay. Yeah, no, you could actually, uh, or, or, or a diskette at the end where you could go, go play with, uh, with uh, all of the, 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 the data. Um, 
Um, there are two, uh, two major issues I have with that, and a lot of minor details which I won't go into, including you know, how profits get declared, uh, what do we do about transfer cost pricing within uh, corporations, where is, it, where is the profit made, where is it realised, all those kinds of questions. But the two major issues are, first of all, just because you've got a graph of the world performing rate of profit doesn't in any way prove that the mechanism that Marx has appealed to is in existence. In fact, the profit rate can fall for all sorts of reasons. And, and so to talk a lot about the falling rate of profit in the sense Marx talked about it and then give me a graph of what happened to the profit rate doesn't do anything. I mean, the, the, the graph that uh, Al had on uh, uh, what happened to the profit rate uh, in a time of falling productivity uh, from the 1960s onwards was, I think, a very good example of uh, but, well, it looks like there must have been Marxist mechanism, but clearly it wasn't Marxist mechanism that was behind that fall, it was something else. Um, we can discuss what it was, but it really was something else. And, 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 and so, so that's the first kind of point I would want, want to make. And, and if you want to show what the mechanism is, you have to show something about productivity. And of course the thing that everybody appeals to, but is less anxious to measure, is the value composition or organic composition of capital, and frankly, I have real, real problems with that as a concept. I think it's a pretty incoherent concept, and I think in aggregate it doesn't mean anything at all. Uh, and uh, it's pretty, so I have real, real, real problems with that. The second thing is that everybody, of course, uses the monetary form of profit, and there's a real question as to what's the relationship between money and value. And there's a real contradiction between money and value. Money is a, a, an indispensable representation of value, but like any representation, there's a big gap between what it itself is and what it's supposed to represent. It's like maps. You know, being a geographer, I know that you can lie through your teeth with maps. In fact, it's one of those. It's a very sophisticated way. I mean, it doesn't show everything. And so, money and Marx talks about this in, in Volume One of Capital is contradictory because it's a uh, a privatized uh, version and a material privatized version of what is a social concept. So social labor is represented by a material thing and the material thing uh, has certain qualities. Uh, but that material thing actually turns out not to be very good uh, in terms of the money commodities for circulation. So you get fiat monies and you get all those sorts of things coming in. And so you get a uh, a peculiar thing, we get a material representation of a social process, and the material representation is the money commodity, which is inadequate, and you then get a representation of the material thing in terms of the fiat monies. Now, this is a big gap between what these fiat monies are about and what they're measuring and, and what the value theory is talking about. And, and uh, money escapes, as it were, any kind of uh, uh, foundation in, in value itself. And so when money escapes in this way, and I mentioned earlier that it's therefore going to become infinite, uh, it's possible to create money infinitely, just add a few zeros to the money supply, and you can carry on uh, adding zeros. You can't do that with commodity. I mean, commodities. I mean, Imelda Marcos had, what, 6,000 pairs of shoes, but she couldn't have millions and millions and trillions of shoes. Uh, but you can have millions and millions and trillions of uh, of, 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 you know, dollars, if you want. So, so, so the capacities of, the, of, of the, what happens with the monetary side of things become some, somewhat different. As Marx also points out in Volume 1 of Capital, there's not only a quantitative deviation between what, what money does and what, what value is about, there's also a qualitative deviation. That money uh, can be applied, and so you can start talking about conscience and honor, uh, which are worth a certain amount of money. Now, what money is and how it gets in, in, in terms of uh, valuing things that becomes very, very significant. The relationship between, say, the value of a Nike shoe in the sense of Marx talking about social labor and its monetary value, which has a lot to do with reputation and all kinds of weird things like that. Uh, and, and this is true of stocks and shares and it's true of housing and it's true of all of these things that have no uh, clear value apart from that which uh, uh, you get when you take it into the market and, and, and start to say, you know, I want X amount of money for this. So the, the qualitative shift to, uh, to uh, all, all these non-commodity forms that can then become commodities like carbon futures, like uh, 
know, you can create all these crazy markets of fictitious capital which then circulate around and, and people can draw money through wealth out of that and become monetarily very rich without actually engaging in any production whatsoever. So this, this relationship, between, this contradictory relation between money and, and what it's supposed to represent is left aside entirely in all of these accounts and everybody assumes it's okay, uh, you know, you've got this monetary measure of value and we just go in and, 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 and draw the graph in monetary terms and that, that's actually representing what's going on in the value sphere. Well, it's not. It may be representing something that's purely going on in the monetary sphere and is subject to something, something else. So, that, so, so without some, finding some way to make sure how capital, as, as measured in money terms, relates to the value form, and I think there are ways in which this can be established and thought about. And, uh, Marx had, I think, that some, some interesting kind of concepts of that. That, 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 that relation seems to me to be, to be something which we really, really, really need to look at. And, and I've raised this before, but we haven't got back into it. I think the abandonment of any mention of gold uh, and silver after the early 1970s as having anything to do with the global monetary system has had very, very significant impacts on why financialization has occurred in the particular way it's occurred. I mean, I'll give you my story about it. I mean, okay, any connection with, with the money commodities was severed. By the end of the 1970s, you have incredible inflation. Well, what happens? They suddenly realize that the people who have to uh, control the inflation, given that the, the, the material base has, has been swept away, are the central banks. And what do the central banks then become? They become uh, sort of anti-inflation. Uh, and, and, and so we get, you know, what Krugman and everybody else complains about is this kind of incredible kind of fear of inflation. And, and it's very interesting reading the Federal Reserve minutes of the summer of uh, 2008, just before Lehman Brothers was about to go crash. And, and, and uh, Krugman did have an account of this. And there's something like, in the conversation, there were 250 mentions of inflation and three of a crisis. And there you are, headed towards a crisis, and all they want to talk about is inflation. I mean, this is kind of, but, but this, is, this is central bank dogma, but it has to be there because uh, you'd abandoned uh, the connectivity to the value form. And the only way you can keep that connectivity is, in fact, by central banks somehow or other, trying to keep things in some, in, in, in some sort of relation. So, so anyway, the data seem to me to be really all over the place in terms of what they, they can help us uh, understand. And they, I'm not saying it's that they're irrelevant. In fact, they're very relevant because they provide the basis upon which public policies are often determined. You no know, public policies are actually determined on, on, on the value theory and no, public poli no, no corporation decides on the value theory. They decide on monetary sig signals. So the monetary system becomes absolutely crucial. So I have all of these kinds of reservations uh, 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 about it. My own view is that 2008, uh, I start to build a little bit an alternative way to think about crises in the midst of this critique. Uh, my, my, own, my own view is that, that uh, actually uh, there was an excess of uh, capital uh, after 2000, and low interest rates and all the rest of it, and it hadn't got anywhere to go, so it went into the housing market. And, and uh, of course, you got the bubble, and then, of course, you got, you got, uh, got the crash, and then the way in which that market is a huge, huge market, $14 trillion in the, in the, uh, the American mortgage market, and an economy of $15 trillion. This is a, this is a very significant uh, whack, but this explains why it became so big, because that's a very, very, very big market into which, you know, my flow of capital was flying in there, and, sloshing around and raising prices and doing all these things and, and it's getting collateralized debt obligations and the debts are offloaded here and there and everywhere and so it had a way of going global uh, which uh, other other crises have not done but it didn't go totally global and there were certain parts of the world that could really come come out of it very fast uh, like China and Latin America to some degree uh, and all and, and raw material producers so there are many things here which are uh, involved the other one which I, I, I just vaguely will mention, point to, is that Marx at some point says, well, you know, uh, the fall in the profit rate can be actually compensated for by decreases in rents and taxes. Now, that also, what follows from that, the decreases in the profit rate 
can, can actually occur by increases in rents and taxes. And there's an interesting kind of question right now, and I'd be very interested to put this one on the table. I think capital is moving into much more of a rentier economy. Uh, rentier in the very, very general sense, in which uh, the aspects of distribution in both rent and interest are dominating everything else, and, and that therefore money is being extracted from those from those spheres in very particular kinds of ways. And, and what this what this would suggest is that uh, Keynes euthanasia, the rentier, has not taken place at all. In fact, it's the other way around. There's actually a, a possibility of a reversion to a Ricardian type falling rate of profit crisis, which is based on rising rents, uh, and, but, but for completely different reasons. Uh, Ricardo put his bet on, on Malthus and and scarcity and diminishing returns in agriculture. Uh, but what we're, we're now into is actually monopoly control of many assets. And we're seeing a land grab going on in Africa. We're seeing all kinds of signs of, uh, of uh, capital moving to preserve its positionality uh, by, by investing in assets rather than actually investing in production. So we're getting these asset levels all over again. Most, most Seriously, of course, right now in China. So let me leave it there and let other people sort of shoot away about their, uh, uh, their views on one way to profit. Okay. Um, so let's, let's have a preliminary indication of who's got a question. So we've got one, Sadat, two, Johnny, three, no. Stavros for Anwar. Um, thank you very much for this presentation, um, David. I'm particularly happy that you have mentioned money in its common form and the way in which it, it plays a role in um, the circuit of capital and how um, um, this turns into fiat money and so on and so forth. Um, I listened to your analysis very, very caref carefully, and I sympathize a lot with that. Um, <coughs> you know, during your talk, yeah, starting with money in a commodity form, it turns um, finance is something into an indigenous um, variety of the capitalist economy in, in which it um, functions. And um, that also relates to the creation of money, which is coming from the indigeneity nature of that creation, which puts, um, as opposed to what financialization literature tells us, that uh, finance is in a set of architectural assets which can exist exogenously out then, which will have an impact upon the real economy and so on and so forth. Now, I listened to you carefully. And, um, um, in your talk, you only mentioned financialization once. But when you are describing capitalism, you talk about excess capital turning into, um, going into the property market and creating bubble as such. And also, capitalism is a rentier economy and so on. Do you have a problem with financialization, the concept of financialization? It doesn't explain itself. <laughs> It, it, it's so broad it doesn't mean anything to me. So I, again, I want to look specifically at the flows. And, and uh, you know, it's, it's like talking about speculation. Actually, every capitalist is a speculator. They have to be. And, and, and you know, but our general sense is that speculators are bad, you know, bad capitalists. But, but, yeah. So I, I, I actually, you know, I, mean, I, I can use the term financialization, but I don't use it very much because it just means too many things. Yes, um, thank you. That was quite interesting, uh, David. But you're a little bit naughty because uh, you uh, um, uh, you uh, did sweeping criticism of just about everybody that used the term. Uh, falling rate of profit or even measurement of profit without being very specific. So it's, I think it's a bit, going to be a bit difficult for those people to defend themselves because they don't know exactly whether you, how much of it, if you tossed out the whole bathtub or just you know, a rubber duck out of it or what. Uh, so I'm going to try to get down to a few specifics. 
And the first step, I would say, do that, is I think that um, Marx wrote many things. Uh, um, uh, different people have different interpretations. Mm -hmm. So it's not, well, I, I give you a copy of my book, I have many quotations from Marx. It probably isn't very productive in this context to uh, refer to what Marx meant, because just about your opponents could do it uh, also, and then would come down to which quote you want, how you interpret it, and so on. So let's get specific. I would say on the question of profit and its measurement and so on, it seems to me the first step is to clarify <coughs> production of absolute surplus value and relative surplus value. And that do these measures capture what arises from those concepts? <laughs> so for example, when you talk about profit, do you see it as a, in this epoch, as something that is being generated by raising of surplus value absolutely, you know, linking working day suppression of wages and so on, or through uh, raising surplus value relatively, you know, the, uh, the um, uh, reducing the, the value of labor power uh, in effect, uh, or a combination of the two. Oh, I, I see the combination of the two. I mean, there's no there's no relative surplus value without absolute surplus value, and absolute surplus value always has a basis in a certain technological configuration. Okay, we next have Anu, I think. Stavros, I think. Oh, I'm no, sorry, Stavros, I beg your pardon. No, Anu, do you want to go ahead? No, please. Well, um, first of all, I had a I, I, I'll put forward uh, a query, but before that, on the point that uh, John made, uh, you mentioned very much that capitalism is becoming nowadays a rentier economy and another form of exploitation, that is, exploitation by appropriation, uh, is, becomes important and even more important than traditional mechanisms. So, how this affects uh, the, your answer to, to John's query, that is, uh, how relative and absolute value, uh, surplus value, are related. Um, it, it is obviously uh, accumulation by, uh, by expropriation uh, is ob obviously a different uh, exploitation mechanism than the extraction of surplus, surplus value. Do they relate in any sense or no? They are totally independent. Uh, first point is the second. Okay, let's drop the tendency of the rate of profit to follow under consumptionism or whatever. As a monistic theory of crisis, I want to carry a bit your explanation of the current crisis. Uh, you, I'll try to reconstruct uh, your argument and tell me if I'm correct from what uh, I've written in your paper given before and what you said here. Uh, you are saying in your paper that uh, the 2008 uh, crisis was the culmination of a series of crises uh, in which accumulation by dispossession orchestrated through the credit system uh, became a significant lever of uh, crisis uh, formation. A series of crises, I presume you refer to the 1990s crisis, right? Okay. What are the, the, the features of this crisis that led to, uh, how can I say, the accumulation of a critical mass that then probably led to what you said here, an excess of capital. You had crisis, didn't they, did you, how they operated, uh, this, how this crisis uh, erupted, what was the, the causality mechanism first, and second, didn't they diffuse whatever problem uh, was uh, created, uh, how this excess uh, of capital was produced in the end of this crisis of, of the 1990s at the beginning of the, uh, at the end of the first decade <coughs> of the 2000s. And then you said, okay, there was excess capital and this uh, went all in the housing market. That's not a universal case, it's only in the US and several other economies, but not, yeah. it's yeah. not a universal phenomenon. Um, and then there was a bubble. Okay, money going into 
uh, a sector and inflating prices or whatever does not necessarily lead, might uh, lead to a bubble, but why this bubble has to be punctured and how? What was, what was the, the last straw that break uh, the camel's back? And then your explanation was that the crash uh, happened. Okay, but why? Okay. Okay. Um, I'll give you when I when I when I write uh, about uh, how crises, uh, crisis tendencies in capital never get resolved; they simply get moved around. I'm talking about a continuous process uh, in which the contradictions of capital are playing an important role. In and I again appeal to Marx, sorry John, I do, but uh, <laughs> when he kind of says that a crisis is a moment where all the contradictions of capital come together. Uh, and that's why I've just written a book on the contradictions of capital. Um, and how they're constantly in play and they're never, they're never erased, like the contradiction between use and exchange value is something that's foundational and never goes away. And of course, the contradiction between use and exchange value can be looked at very specifically in the case of housing markets and property markets and all the rest of it, uh, as can the whole kind of question of uh, how do you value the asset, what's the monetary value, and uh, why do we uh, have to have money as a measure of uh, exchange value, and what's involved in the private property relations and all the rest of it. So there's a whole set of interlocking contradictions that actually pin together what's going on in the housing market right the way down to what the state does and did in Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac and, and, and actually setting up a situation in which uh, uh, subprime mortgages became actually a state policy uh, in order to integrate uh, uh, marginalized populations into quote the American dream but at the same time of course create a market where there was no market before, and we find the same thing going on, of course, in uh, microfinance uh, and, uh, all, uh, and, and all of that, which starts as a kind of a, a charitable thing, microcredit, and has become a means by which finance capital is sucking value out of low-income populations, and it's doing the same uh, very much, of course, in the housing market uh, in the United States. But let me give you uh, a, a a brief sort of overview of the continuity of this. Uh, between 1945 and say mid 1970s, there were, there were very few uh, financial crises. Uh, since 1975, there have been 10 a penny. Some countries have been through three or four of them uh, in the last 30 or 40 years. The first big outbreak, of course, was the surplus capital that's recycled back to the New York investment banks in the mid 1970s. Uh, from, uh, the, from the Gulf states, from the oil revenues that uh, came back. And this is surplus capital and had to find a place to go. Uh, the US economy was in the doldrums, so nobody was going to invest very much in the United States. So what the hell were they going to do with the surplus capital? Well, Walter Riston's idea is we lend to states. And the reason we lend to states is because we can always go find them. Uh, so they lent money like crazy to uh, you know, Mexico, to Ecuador, to Poland, to, you know, wherever. And, uh, of course, uh, what came out of that was uh, the, the, what was called the Third World Debt Crisis, and which supposed to child was, uh, was Mexico. And in 1982, uh, Mexico couldn't pay its debt back. And so what happened? Structural adjustment by the IMF and all the rest of it, which did what? It sucked it to the people in order to get the money out of Mexico to pay off the banks. And there was some you know, hair cutting going on through the Brady kind of thing. So there was a, you know, there was a big crisis in Mexico. And, and it wasn't only there. If you look at the number of countries that were caught in that third world debt crisis, uh, included you know, Poland, Ecuador, you know, just off it was, it was a huge, huge kind of thing. Surplus capital had been lent to countries uh, at, at uh, what seemed like attractive rates, then the interest rate went up, and then bang, they couldn't pay. Uh, this is a this is a, a form of accumulation by dispossession, which has continued ever since through IMF structural readjustment, and 
you can see very well what's, how it's working right now in the case of Argentina. I mean, what's going on? Uh, vulture capital, as they like to call it, is in there trying to actually screw the Argentinians over a, a debt that was uh, accumulated during a kind of a, a pretty uh, corrupt uh, regime. And, and you know, I mean, so you, you get into these these sorts of these sorts of things. So you're 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 trying to get blood out of a stone. And 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 so so you know, I think that actually every IMF. Uh, Structural adjustment program is the equivalent to me of a, uh, of a bout of accumulation by dispossession. The standard of living of the Mexicans was reduced by about 25% in three or four years in, after 1982 as they tried to, to, to pay off the debt. This is, this is actually taking you know, assets from one part of the world and feeding it to the other. The, the investment banks are doing fine. Uh, out of this, of course, uh, and they're getting richer and richer and richer. So accumulation by dispossession has been a very important feature, and one of those areas where it's been has been, of course, in the property market. Uh, many of the crashes that have occurred since the 1970s have been in the property markets, and again, I, I get sort of uh, annoyed at some of them because uh, nobody looks at this and kind of says, "Well, this is a crisis of urbanisation." Why is there this crisis of urbanization? What's the role of urbanization in relationship to this? And who's dispossessing whom uh, when you start to actually use eminent domain uh, or uh, you start doing the favela reorganization structures in Rio or you kind of try to clean out the, the slums of Mumbai to make way for condominium development and office development. You know, I mean, all these kinds of things are going on. So there's a lot of dispossession and displacement going on. And, and uh, I think that there's a story to be told there about the neoliberal era that is not captured by some of, some of this data that we're looking at. But on the ground, uh, that included, of course, deindustrialization and, uh, and, 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 and the like, and the devaluation of a lot of the fixed capital investment that was around. So, so yeah, there's a, there's a continuous thing. I'm sort of just jumping on various components, but there's a continuous kind of process where that was going on, and then it was increasingly difficult, I think, uh, for uh, my hypothesis would be increasingly difficult after 2001 and the end of the kind of dot-com boom, uh, and, and Greenspan kind of saying, okay, oh, keep the interest rate real low. It was very difficult to stop uh, the housing market being a very attractive target for, for speculative uh, activity. And of course, and like all speculations, as somebody said, you know, David Cox kind of said, he keeps going until somebody gets nervous and starts pulling out, and then you pull out, and you know, the emperor has no clothes, and boom, uh, you're, you're, you're soon, soon in, in a crash. But uh, yeah, that was not going on everywhere in the world, but it was going on in a significant number of parts of the world, including Ireland, Spain, Hungary, and, and, and uh, Latvia, and, and places like that. So it was a very significant thing globally. But it was made global by the fact that it got into the financial system. As soon as it got into the pores of the financial system, Paribas went under, or didn't go under, but declared it couldn't pay. Right? And why? Because it had, it had invested in all these collateral -like debt obligations and that. So suddenly it appears in France, suddenly it appears in Germany, suddenly it appears all over the world, wherever anybody's invested in these things. And, and then, of course, the crash of the export, you know, the deleveraging in the, in, in the U.S. housing market, which has been absolutely spectacular, that deleveraging has actually created uh, considerable stress in terms of consumer markets and, 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 and that, which means that, that, that China had to substitute its own internal uh, market, not in terms of personal consumption, but in productive consumption and investment in infrastructures. So anybody who was, was oriented to the China trade, and we've seen a reorientation of that in America to the China trade, and those countries which uh, are actually supplying raw materials for China, like uh, Australia, quickly recovering uh, because China was, 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 was creating such a boom. China's consumed half of the world's steel supplies, half of the world's cement supplies over the last five years. So anybody producing raw materials for cement and then of course copper, Chile recovered very well. And of course the other big demand from China is for soybeans. Latin America has turned itself into one vast soybean plantation uh, for the China trade. And it's done very well out there. But now China's faltering and it's getting difficult and it's not getting into the same thing. So 
all of those countries are beginning to experience difficulties. Brazil is in difficulty. Australia is not doing too well right now. I mean, you can see the way in which the thing gets transferred and translated, or how the geography of it is moving around. And the only, so, so we're, we're in a dangerous situation right now, and, and, and simply because of the rockiness of the China thing. So that's the sort of story that I would tell. Okay. Um, Sorry, I don't know. <laughs> we're going to run out of time. Can we go on a bit, Turan, if, if, if we need to? Uh, <laughs> um, all right, Anu, please keep it short. Uh, as as I can do that, let me try. Then I will stop you. Okay, fine. <laughs> Microphone. Um, <coughs> I admire your work, David, in, uh, greatly, and have followed it. And I, but <laughs> no, but the, the but is the same but that you have about me, so it's not a different but. <laughs> I read capital very differently, and it's not because Marx said it, but because it is a fantastic resource. I see it as a multi-thousand page project, an attempt to lay out a systematic foundation for analysis of the capitalist mode of production, and I was always impressed from the start about Marx's obstinate refusal to introduce something until he felt that it was the right place. And the trouble is that we then have to read it that way, you can't go in and dip in my opinion, uh, like a salad bar, and take out what you want and throw the rest away. And that's one difference between us. I, I really don't think that's the right way to do it. So uh, after, and it's possible that Marx changed his mind, but if that's the case, then why wouldn't he change his mind from the Gurgers of the volume three? How can he make those comparisons without addressing the issue of the logic of the argument? Then, if you accept that, one of the key things that we as economists have to do, which we perhaps don't have to do, is that we have to talk about issues that are relevant to economics, which are not particularly in Marx per se, relative prices, interest rates, exchange rate, trade patterns, stock prices, the effect of new purchasing power, budget deficits, and accumulation, and so on, and the recurrence, at least in my uh, notion of crisis, of great depressions. Now, if you don't have that theory, then you end up doing what you do, which is you attribute these to power and plans of nations and groups of people. And you've said that repeatedly. This group, that group did it. And I don't think, uh, I'm not saying there aren't such powers and plans, but I think that this is the only resort you have if you don't have any explanation of these other patterns. Let me give you an example. You talk a lot about deindustrialization. That's a deindustrialization of the US as Amit pointed out, that's the reindustrialization and the rise of a new power elsewhere. So it is not, in fact, a systemic theory. It's the location of winners and losers, which is, uh, I think, uh, old history in, in the analysis of capital, uh, that it moves around and it hurts some and uh, benefits others. So uh, I take the charge that you make very seriously that we need to have systematic answers to these and I don't think they can be presented in you know half an hour a year or whatever so and, but I do think that we have to read capital as a project which we may reject on its own terms and if we reject it that's fine then we substitute something else I find it a tremendous source of a connected set of ideas and, by, and that can be presented in my opinion in another uh, location. I've been working on this book for a long time for precisely the reason. I read your book before I started mine. So I have certainly had it in mind. But I come out with a very different thing. Uh, as for the falling red trumpet, I want to stay away from for now because precisely it takes a little elaboration to explain and answer those. But I believe it's absolutely <coughs> possible to make that argument systematically and address your uh, concerns without necessarily persuading you. Do you, do you want to come back briefly? <laughs> <laughs> we're, we're, we're obviously going to have a very interesting discussion. <laughs> He's got the rocky. Yeah. Uh, I think David Cox wanted to speak incredibly briefly. <laughs> uh, incredibly brief. After uh, initially uh, expressing doubt about uh, causation, uh, you did uh, give a kind of a analysis of the cause of the crisis as lodged in a process that goes back several decades of excess capital 
uh, flowing into uh, some area where it caused a financial crisis and then it flowed into another area. Uh, but you also noted that this process that did not happen before 1975. So what is it that you think changed about uh, capitalism uh, in the last several decades that produced this process that was not characteristic of the earlier part of the post-World War II period? And the second and related question is, uh, big crises such as the kind we have now in the past have been followed by major restructuring of capitalism. Uh, do you foresee a uh, likelihood that the kind of processes we've seen for the last two decades, which some call neoliberal capitalism, that this, this is a system, is this a system crisis of neoliberal capitalism that will perhaps lead to uh, restructuring in a different form emerging? Um, I just want to make uh, one comment, comment to an or two. Um, uh, actually, there has been a net loss of manufacturing jobs globally. Uh, so deindustrialization, yes, it's moved around, but you've got to have a theory of how it moves around, too. And, and you economists are very good at looking at aggregate data, but you're not very good at looking at how it moves around. We'll see. Yeah. It's a bit of a Yeah, well, I, well, I like sweeping, sweeping statements. Yeah, but you shouldn't incriminate everyone. <laughs> yeah, no, no. Um, so, so, yeah, um, I, I think the answer to your, your question is, is it going to be given by Ricardo tomorrow, right? Is that correct? <laughs> You're going to give the answer to that question of what happened with the rise of neoliberalism. It's, it's, it's my that's, it's, that's, that's We do a division of labor, you see. <laughs> I'm not going to answer your question. You have to listen to him tomorrow. So, yeah. <laughs> so you're endorsing it in advance. You have to read <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, no, I may differ with him tomorrow, but, uh, you know, pro tem, pro tem, this is a good way out of the difficulty. What about the restructuring? Well, the restructuring is... This is why I have. Yeah. Now, well, I think, I think, look, I think there are a lot of issues that we haven't covered here which are very, uh, very important. I think this whole kind of question of, uh, uh, should we reformulate the value theory? Uh, what do we do about, I mean, there's all this stuff about uh, uh, knowledge as capital these days and cognitive capitalism and so on. I actually don't accept a lot of that, mainly because it comes from, you know, you know certain, certain kind of understandings I don't share. But nevertheless, I think there's something terribly important there. Uh, what is productive labor and what is unproductive labor? I think uh, we have to really think about that. Um, as I mentioned in the paper, you know, uh, yeah, the factory labor, which we tended to think of as central, is gone, uh, except in you know, Bangladesh and China and all the rest of it. But actually, a vast amount of value is produced uh, in New York City. And I use this figure of you stand on the corner of 86th Street. Second Avenue, and what do you see? Well, people are producing hamburgers, and why would we say that they're not producing value? And when Marx talks about uh, the collective laborer uh, in volume one of Capital, he opens a can of worms because the waiters who are actually serving them are part of the collective labor, and so are they part of the value production system? What's going on with the cognitive uh, activities? Uh, I kind of mentioned, uh, how is it that Nike, you know, share value and shoe prices are far higher than they should be in relationship to any kind of measure of, of uh, labor input. Uh, and it's all about reputation. So, and, and, and how do you create reputation? Uh, and and uh, is that, is that a, a, some, some, has that something to do with value creation? And how do we account for the way in which Marx talked about the general intellect and talked about uh, science uh, and knowledge uh, as being part of the value production system? There are all these kinds of questions because I think they're terribly important because we're finding new ways of, of value production. For example, when we go on Facebook, we do the labor, actually. 
we do the labour at the same time as we consume it, and we've actually moved from a situation where there's a clear distinction between producers and consumers, that we've all become what Alden Toffler calls prosumers. We create the value in Google, we create the value in Facebook by what we do. Who appropriates it? Well, it's a rentier relation, relation in a way. And, and somebody, and so somebody's, you know, Zuckerberg is making billions, you know, uh, out of our labor. Uh, and, and we've now got this system where, uh, you know, you check into an airport and you do the work. The consumer increasingly does the work. And, and, and actually use these new configurations. So there's a lot of things of this sort going on which need to be looked at. And we haven't looked at it in this, in this conference, which we need to, which we need to pay attention to. Um, I've got a point to make, Ben's got a point to make, uh, is there anybody else at the moment? And Ricardo's got a point to make. I would say Simon, that, that, that's fine, I think we can go over it, but, but uh, I'm going to be about 10 or 15 minutes at the end, so everybody should be prepared. <laughs> With housekeeping. Okay, I'm, I'm going to say something. I would like to mount a limited defence of an economist's focus on the rate of profit. Because on, the agri on some aggregate measure of the rate of profit. And the reason is that the rate of profit is a summary statistic which embodies a lot of different information. In particular, information about the difference between labor productivity and the real wage. Information about the difference between or the ratio between labor productivity on the one hand and capital intensity on the other, meaning by capital intensity, the amount of real fixed capital per hour there is in the economy. And finally, the ratio of output prices to fixed capital prices. Um, now, that, that's, those are just sort of, that's just definitional. It, it doesn't say anything more than is in the rate of profit itself, but it, it's an organizing tool for thinking about the ways in which the, the overall economy works. And it is true that the rate of profit in some sense is a summary statistic of the, the aggregate capitalist economy. It's not inevitable that a focus on the rate of profit means a focus on the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. These tendencies can go in any direction. And, but what, what it is what the rate of profit does do is enable one to organize one's thoughts. That's the first point. The second point is that um, if we think of the US economy for the moment, one can think of three big crisis moments in the last 80, 90 years. The first was 1929 onwards. The second was the period of the 1970s. And the third is the run-up to 2007-2008. Um, and what is striking is that 1929 was not a falling rate of profit crisis. 2007-2008 was not a falling rate of profit crisis. But Al, as Al showed this morning, the 1970s was a falling rate of profit crisis and it was resolved politically and ideologically. There was no market resolution. It was resolved politically and ideologically. And it seems to me that that's quite important too. And, but the rate of profit you know, enables a focus of one's thoughts in that sense. And I would like to defend it as a summary statistic in that sense. Now, I know that other people have a different view in terms of the inevitability of what tends to rate of profit fall on crisis and so on. But one doesn't have to say the rate of profit will fall to focus on it. The last point I would say is that can one connect these various things to value theory in, in the manner that you problematize? Yes, I think one can, but clearly that's a big conversation, that's not something, something to do now. And the last thing I would say in terms of your Facebook examples and, and so on, is that if you have a vision that productive labor in the world contributes to a vast pool 
a surplus value via its exploitation. And individual capitals, whether they be Facebook or whatever, extract from that pool through their competitive strategies, then that is a, an organizing way of thinking about it. And you don't need to worry about what the particular workers of face, that making Facebook are doing or, or what this particular waiter is doing or anything like that. It's irrelevant in that sense. But that's sort of my perspective. And I don't think it's, uh, you know, other people clearly have different ideas. And Ben, presumably, will also have something different to say. I, I have to, I'm okay on that. I mean, I think all of us are very conscious that there are students here, and uh, there's one thing I wanted to say about that, which is we can, they, hopefully they can observe that Marx 101 is nothing like microeconomics 101, where you receive uh, conventional wisdom. Here, just the basic principles of Marxism are being heavily debated, and this is not received knowledge, and it's about the way in which Marxism is open to many, many different interpretations and not just communication of received wisdom. Otherwise, I wanted to say I, I very much agree with, with most of what uh, David has, has said. Um, you know, there's a but coming. And the but is the framing of, of, of the issues which he began in terms of a dichotomy or even an opposition between the law of the tendency to rate a profit to fall and the counteracting tendencies. And then the more favoured chapter 15, concerned with the issue of whether and how the massive surplus value uh, can be continued to be accumulated. And I see these two things as the same thing. I don't see them as different from, from one another. The law and the counteracting tenses are about not empirical movements in the rate of profit, although on occasion that will be important and a way to organise your thoughts, as Simon has suggested, but really we're concerned with can the massive surplus value continue to be accumulated and what forms does this take whether in a crisis or not. So I think the law is, and the counter terms are relevant not just for understanding crises, but periods of accumulation which are successful as well. Just to encourage you to accept this, I would argue that the law and counteracting tendencies are concerned not just immediately with so-called economic issues, but, but with economic and social reproduction in general, for which your own work on fixes across various dimensions of that economic and social reproduction seems to me to be an appropriate way to, to proceed, but not in some sense separate from or inconsistent with the law and counteracting tendencies. I, 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 agree, with, I agree with that, and, and actually if, if you had the impression that I thought measuring as, as you have been doing or uh, the point that, that what's happening to the profit rate is irrelevant, that's not what I hoping you would draw from what I said. In fact, I think it's very relevant. Uh, it's just that uh, when you attach it to the tendency of all, there's a problem. Uh, but also beyond that, I think uh, there is a, a little space. Uh, I got worried a little bit by the tendency to make it seem as if it's so factual that there's no interpretive frame that needs to be put around it. And I think that it would be helpful to have so what does this mean, you know? And I think the way you explained it is fine, and I'm, I'm very happy with that, and I'm very glad that, that, that to see that, and it's very glad to see what, what, what you were doing with it, what Anwar was doing with it, I, mean, I think this is extremely helpful. Uh, so so I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not questioning that at all, so I, 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 hope, I hope you didn't assume that. Uh, Ricardo, you've been dying to say something short. <laughs> I'm dying, but to say something short. <laughs> 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 No, I, I, I try to be as short as possible. Um, my kind of intervention is the opposite. I start saying what I disagree on, eh? which is the way you began, which by the way is very similar to the way I began tomorrow, about money as a necessary representation of value. But on this I say nothing. Uh, on what you said about the falling rate of profit, on, I agree completely, and then I will stop now. But unfortunately, it is there that I want to say something. That is, I will try to defend Marx's idea that somehow, somewhere, in some way, I want to go into the day, is that there is a priority of the tendency of the rate of profit to fall. Let me open a short parenthesis. 
I think that all the work about the measure of uh, uh, the rate of profit are important. Huh? Uh, the point is that uh, from there one can say nothing about the falling rate of profit. On the one cannot say that the crisis of the 70s was a falling rate of profit because you were, everybody worked on exposed magnitudes and this does not allow for me to, to distinguish. What is my defense of Marx's idea? Very quickly. The distinction of use value and value, or the distinction of position, exteriorization, becomes capital in the place of, of uh, value, living labor in the place of use value. Living labor extracted from living labor power, that is, from the bidders of that living labor power, the workers. Now, Marx arrived at the conclusion that there is an internal drive to the expansion of surplus value, surplus labor, and this gives way to a, an expulsion, expulsion of workers from factories, let us say, factories. This, by the way, for me, is the definition of capital. Not money, not commodity, a social, uh, a social relation. From there, you are one step to a falling rate of profit theory. Because if you imagine, it is just an abstraction. Huh? All the world, because all the reason it must be global, all the world, uh, you imagine that uh, the, the wage is zero, it is ridiculous. But Marx does that one time. If you imagine that everybody works 24 hours a day, you have that the surplus value is the total new value. It is the total living labor expressed in money, in the numerator, it has an absolute limit. There is no absolute limit to the increase of constant capital at the denominator. There is a maximum rate of profit. I don't buy this story because I think that there can be uh, a change in the price of output relative to the price of the element of constant capital so that the denominator does rise, does rise not so much, does not rise. But this is this is the idea. So, two phrases to end. There is a reason why this is the tendency. Then there are those that uh, Engels calls the counteracting factors. For me, this gives an organization to the thinking of the crisis theory, which goes actually, I think, in your direction, because the point is to understand how the fact that the counteracting factors wins is the cause of a succession of crises in different forms of capital. So to relate chapter 13 to chapter 15, so to speak. Right. That's, that's my, my way of thinking. Okay. David, do you, do you wish to, to give a grand summary in any sense? Oh, you said that in such a grim way that I couldn't possibly try to do it. So.